BBC Radio. London-based photographer Ben Buchanan found himself in the right place at the right time to capture what went on behind the velvet rope of the New York City club scene in the 1980s. I always dreamed of going out to the clubs in the 1980s in New York and his photographs have now been included in a brand new exhibition that features the work of Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat. It's called Crossing Lines. Ben Buchanan, welcome. Hi. Now tell me, Basquiat and, and Keith Haring, they're iconic cultural figures these days, but you were there with them in New York, downtown in the 1980s, documenting a time when they were emerging. What were they both really like? Well, they were slightly different personalities. Um, I knew uh, Basquiat better just because he was, I would see him everywhere. I'd see him two or three times a week. He would either be at the area, either just hanging out, or sometimes he would bring his records in and DJ music in the lounge, mostly jazz, reggae, um, eclectic stuff, and he would just bring in a couple of crates of records and just sit there and play the music. And sometimes you'd be doodling or drawing, and even though he was a big art star of the day, he was just, you know, hanging out, having drinks, and carrying on like anybody else at a nightclub. Um, and if, for people who aren't familiar with Basquiat's work, I mean, his work is now, I think, has sold. One of his pieces in particular is sold. It's the most expensive artwork ever to be sold in the history of. Well, he's the, the most expensive American artist. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, it's extraordinary. He's getting higher prices than any, anybody else. Mm. Uh, and Keith Haring, what was he like? Well, Keith Haring was just very fun and always up for, you know, I'd go and, because I'd see him all the time as well, and sometimes we would just hang out, and sometimes we would like, oh, take a picture of this, or let's do this, and so he would like to be involved, like he really liked dressing up, and there was one theme which ran for six weeks called Fairy Tales, and there was a gingerbread house, and, he, and there was a witch, and he liked all the prosthetic makeup, and then one day he was decided he was going to be the witch, did the makeup, the dress, and just hung out in this gingerbread house and scared people. Nobody knew it was him. I knew. Other people knew because we could see his glasses. So. And you talk about themed nights. People might be a bit confused. Area was the nightclub, which you were the house photographer. Yes. Uh, and what that this sounds super wild. All these creative types, Andy Warhol included, would converge on this nightclub, but they every six weeks they'd shut the doors, redesign it completely over like four days, spend you know fifty thousand dollars, which is a lot of money in 1983, That's and completely wild. redesign it to a theme. The theme could be night, it could be food, or it could be sports, or it could be sex, or it could be art, or it could be fashion, or obelisks, or the color red, whatever the theme <laughs> was. All the artists would come in and do something toward that theme and it was a bit like a natural history museum there'd be dioramas with like either live people or live animals or people behind them with a backdrop um we had andy warhol to sort of sit in this box for an evening just as andy warhol and you could tap on the glass <laughs> and take his picture and wave at him and wow. he was just like an a, 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 you know a museum exhibit was it true that Grace Jones turned up with her boyfriend off London on a motorbike and drove through the nightclub on um, this motorbike? I've heard this story. About yes, that that, that, that was true. Area. It was her birthday, and she was going to do a, a performance, and uh, he drove her up through the nightclub, up the front steps, into the nightclub on the motorbike. I'm not sure if you could do that these days with <laughs> health and safety, but I imagine. she was allowed to. Um, I think it was planned. I, I didn't know that it was planned. And then you, you, know, you just hear this roaring of the engines and them whizzing through the crowd. But back to Basquiat and also Keith Haring, they cut their teeth at this club area where they would be coming up with ideas and doing their work. Um, what do you think their legacy has been? I mean, it obviously evolved and changed their work. They began from very much street art beginnings. Mm. What's been their legacy, do you think? Well, I think it's 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 inspired a whole new generation of artists, um, such as um, Cause and Stick, and a lot of other publicly accessible art. The people that didn't they didn't study art, they don't speak art speak. They just like things which are interesting, and it's political as well. So that um, 
that really helps and it brings it to a wider audience of people that don't even maybe don't follow art but like the politics of it or they like the children like it children always love that stuff and, and you know and then they get the meanings behind as well yeah, well, both of those were very much about articulating political and social messages, things like racism, uh, the AIDS crisis. Uh, uh, Keith Haring eventually died of complications of, of AIDS. Um, so they were very much in their work when it came to their political causes, weren't they? Uh, yes, because before that it was um, very you know it wasn't socially acceptable to even talk about it or um to mention it or uh, to know people who had it so they brought it to the forefront and were able to get public money around uh, to help find a cure and to make it acceptable to know people like that and to, you know you can shake hands with somebody who has aids and you're not going to catch aids yeah. and that was the scare of the time that you couldn't even be in the same room so this really made it made public aware and got the funding to uh, help, to get help for those people. That's right. Ben Buchanan is with me. He's a photographer who captured the likes of Keith Haring, Jean-Michel Basquiat and Warhol, all of those artists from the 80s that you probably know these days because they're very famous and very wealthy if they're in fact still alive. It was a very hedonistic time. Um, you weren't even a photographer though, when you got the job as the house photographer at Area, this raucous wild nightclub that I've only heard reports about. How do you get a job when you don't even... <laughs> well, I, they wanted me to do some slides for the walls, like on a rear projection screen. So um, I was like, OK, I can do that. My friend owned the club and he said, well, I worked for a photographer, but I didn't really know about photography. I knew how to carry cases and hand him lenses and go up, drop off film to be developed. And he thought, since I work for a photographer, then you must know about photography, so we need some slides. So I figured out how to do the slides, copying other slides and put them on the wall. And so we really need to go around and document all this stuff because nobody's doing it and uh, we need somebody here all the time. And we're not going to pay you, but we'll if you will pay for film and drink tickets and, and uh, <laughs> drink tickets <laughs> I'll we work did for drink tickets we yeah. for drink tickets so I could always have a drink in one hand and a camera in the other <laughs> and I got they gave me a camera and told me where to set the dial and set the dial on the flash and and I didn't change it for all those years just kept it uh, like that and uh, and then the films you know they came out as long as they were in, in focus and the exposure was right and I was happy I like could focus on who I was trying to photograph. Yeah. Um, were people happy to be photographed in those days? Um, they didn't mind as long as you asked. And I was quite shy, so I'd always creep up to them and ask them at a moment that they weren't interrupting whatever they were doing and say, can I take a quick picture? I'm a house photographer. And 95% of the time they said yes. Uh, you know, if I asked them again, they might say yes. Uh, eventually they would say yes. And I'd take two pictures and then walk away and leave them to do what they do and I might see them some other time in the day or the evening and uh, get to know them a little bit, talk with them and uh, but there are a few people standing around doing not very much so yeah. I thought this is a good time to entertain them and uh, they can entertain me and we'll take a few pictures and it worked. And it they're, worked. They're very candid photographs that you, you've taken. And these days, I'd love your perspective as a photographer. You obviously grew and developed into a professional photographer um, and a creative photographer. But celebs get asked for photos all the time these days, and they they just uh, so well. They're either there's either so many of them, or they're so well thought out. They're without any kind of soul or presence. Um, how has photography changed? Is it for the better or for the worse now that people have so much access to the technology? Because your shots just seem so candid. Well, I guess they were. People weren't didn't have an army of publicists behind them, so they weren't saying, stand here, look this way. You know, They were just there, and so taking pictures wasn't a really thing, and uh, people weren't really focused on their social media so they weren't really thinking this image is going to get somewhere or it may get somewhere or i hope mm. it gets somewhere it wouldn't really they go anywhere just, except for maybe one magazine yeah they might get one magazine that was like a monthly magazine or you know and that came out quite to an obscure audience who were interested in entertainment 
club scene of, of New York. And sometimes they went a little bit further, but only if they were really salacious. And that wasn't really my business mm. to do. You know, I'm not going to sit up a tree and trying to get a photo of somebody. I want to talk to them and meet them a bit. And uh, they were quite relaxed about taking the pictures. It's great. It's great. Well, we're lucky you were there. We were lucky that you captured it. Um, Basquiat's girlfriend at the time when you were photographing at Area, the, the raucous New York nightclub, was Madonna. And Basquiat famously said, this girl, she's going to be huge. Hmm. Did you get that sense when you met Madonna? Um, well, I, when I met Madonna was before she was famous and she's worked at the bar called Lucky Strike and she served me drinks as a bartender so I, and I just heard that she was a singer and she was going to be something but uh, I didn't get the point that she was a fairly grumpy bartender but was she? yeah um, I can't imagine <laughs> yeah she probably didn't want to be bartending but had to be and I was just you know, uh, I think when I think at that time when Area happened he was already going out with the owner of Area's do uh, sister so she, she had already moved on. Um. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> well, at least you heard it here first, Madonna, grumpy bartender. Um, ben Buchanan, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. That's Ben Buchanan there, photographer, uh, whose photographs are included in the NGV Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat exhibition, Crossing Lines. It's on now at the National Gallery of Victoria. I had to play this today. And you can dance. This is Madonna. For inspiration.